Israel Finkelstein is a leading figure in the archaeology and history of ancient Israel. Over 40 years of field work and research, he has helped to change the way archaeology is conducted, the Bible is interpreted, and the history of Israel is reconstructed. I sat down with Israel over several sessions to talk about how a lifetime of work has informed the story of ancient Israel. Today we're going to begin our series of video clips about the archaeology of ancient Israel and the Bible. And today I'd like to talk about the very beginning to introduce the whole topic. And that kind of begs the question, what is the beginning of a discussion about ancient Israel? Where do we need to start? This is a great question because there are two options here. Either to go with the Bible. The Bible has a very clear notion about the history of ancient Israel. It starts with patriarchs. It goes to the Exodus. then wandering, conquest, period of the judges, and then the beginning of the monarchy and the two Hebrew kingdoms, and destruction, of course. This is one way to go about this. The second way to go is to uh, take a pers the perspective of historical reconstruction of uh, the ancient Near East, Canaan, Israel, and what archaeology tells us. And we will go according to the second. Great. So we want to start with what we know from outside sources and bring in the biblical text as needed. Critically, the idea is to describe the history of ancient Israel using three tools. The first one, of course, is the biblical text, critically looking at it. The second one is archaeology, also critically looking, and of course, the records of the ancient Near East. So, what's the period that we need to start with? So I think that we need to start with the Late Bronze Age because the Late Bronze Age is the stage setting for the rise of ancient Israel. I mean, if you wish to speak about the very beginning of ancient Israel, we know about it archaeologically, let's say in the 12th century, maybe the late 13th century BC in the highlands. So we have to take a step back and look at the situation in Canaan before. So I suppose that we need to mention, first of all, the takeover uh, of Canaan by Egypt in the Late Bronze Age by the Pharaoh Thutmose III of the 18th dynasty in the 15th century BC. This is the beginning because at that time, the Pharaohs, Egypt, established a system of domination over Canaan. In fact, Canaan was a province of the Egyptian empire. And there in this province of the Egyptian empire, we have enough information archeologically and also from uh, extra biblical text in order to reconstruct the historical situation. Right, so we're starting in a time period in which Egypt and the southern Levant are intricately connected. Right, when we reconstruct the history of ancient Israel, we need to be very careful not to pluck the history of Canaan, Israel from the bigger perspective of the ancient Near East and the Levant in particular. So how would you describe Late Bronze Age Canaan? So I think that when we speak about Late Bronze Age Canaan, we need to take uh, two factors into account. The first one is the system of Canaanite city-states. This begins before the Late Bronze Age, already in the third millennium or the beginning of the second millennium, but it comes to some sort of uh, a peak in the Late Bronze Age. So first of all, the system of city-states. And the second thing is to understand better the way the Egyptians dominated Canaan, which means where were the centers, how did they rule over Canaan, what was their involvement mil from the military point of view, from the administrative point of view, if you wish also from the economic point of view, no less important, the social structure of Canaan in the late Bronze Age. That sounds great, but how are we gonna get all of that information? So I think that we should uh, pinpoint on the 14th century BC. And why is that? Because in the 14th century, there is some sort of a window of opportunities open for us. And I refer to the Amarna letters, to the period the, of rule of the 18th dynasty here in Canaan. And we have this information from a chance uh, find in Egypt of the Tel El Amarna tablets. We are speaking about the discovery in the late 19th century of uh, a hoard, so to speak, of something like a little less than 400 tablets. This is the diplomatic correspondence between two pharaohs, Amenophis III and Amenophis IV. The second one is the famous Achenaton, with 
uh, equal powers in the region, such as Assyria and Babylonia and Hatti and so on, and the, also the petty kings of Canaan, which means the city-states under the domination of uh, the pharaohs. And they correspond about daily matters. But while they do this, first of all, we get the names of the city-states, and we also get very important information about the, uh, I would say, uh, not only diplomatic situation, but geopolitical in the bigger picture of the Levant and beyond, and the map of city-states in Canaan. And this is absolutely important in order to understand what happened next. What a crucial asset to have the actual letters from Pharaoh to subject kingdoms in this area. So this is wonderful. We, you actually can really read the letters and understand a lot. Now, some of the letters are easy to decipher in a way from the geographical point of view because they give the name of uh, the locality from where the, this petty king, whatever the name, wrote to the pharaoh. So um, uh, in, here and there we hear about uh, Biridia, whom we know the two of us very well from our excavations at Megiddo. So he writes from Megiddo it is, and it is very obvious. However, there are tablets which, are, which were damaged or tablets that already when they had been written, they did not provide the name of the town and only the name of the ruler. And then over there we have a challenge of uh, identifying the place of the ruler and then creating this map of Canaan at that time. So how to do this? This is something that goes back to the beginning of the 20th century. I mean, the first big book on Amarna uh, was published in uh, the very beginning uh, of the century, over a century ago. And there have been endless debates and disputes about the location of the Canaanite city-states. About um, uh, 20 years ago, uh, we at Tel Aviv University, a team of scholars, researchers came to the conclusion that there is a way to bypass the traditional discussion about the location of the uh, rulers and how to do this. We assumed that the tablets were dispatched from the place of uh, uh, the given ruler. And now, so we said to ourselves that uh, we can uh, take the tablets and look for the uh, composition of the clay from which the tablet was, tablet was made, which means we are looking at the petrography, at the mineralogy of the clay of the tablet. And accordingly, we can identify really the place where the clay was taken from. And in some cases, we can really pinpoint to a situation of 20 or 200 meters. I remind you that Biridia, the Biridia letters can be identified the location by a certain formation on the slope of Megiddo. We can really pinpoint to the place. So Yuval Goren, he was the person who did really the actual test of the tablets and uh, Nadav Naaman, my friend, who is a scholar of uh, the Amarna period, an historian, and myself as an archaeologist, we joined forces and we managed, in fact, to decipher or to identify most of these places, not all of them, most of them, and really create for the first time a reliable map of Canaan in the uh, Late Bronze Age. A and and, and the, maybe uh, as a promo, I will say that the most important thing is to understand that we are dealing with a demorphic situation, which means the lowlands with many uh, city-states, uh, densely inhabited from the point of view of the countryside. The city-states rule over relatively small territories, and there are many of them, whereas the situation in the highlands was very different in the sense that there were several big, uh, territorially big city-states. Jerusalem, we're sitting here in Jerusalem, Jerusalem, one of them. Shechem, Nablus today, another. Chazor, in a way, rules over big parts of the Galilee. And this situation of uh, relatively empty land in the highlands with um, a social, social structure, which was different, we'll speak about it maybe, it's very important to understand later the rise of ancient Israel. The Amarna letters give us a good understanding of where these places are, who is where. We have this city-state situation, highlands, lowlands, but the Egyptians are in charge. Yeah. How are they administering 
this territory. So the Egyptians are in charge here and they are uh, ruling over Canaan uh, with their administrators and small military units um, uh, garrisoned in several places, about six administrative centers uh, about, uh, we know about them from the tablets themselves, of course, also from archaeology. Gaza was the center of Egyptian rule in Canaan. Jaffa was a very important place. We have also archaeology, archaeological information. Bechan was another one with archaeological information. And then uh, we have three farther to the north in the northern parts uh, of the Levant. Uh, so altogether six centers. And we see how the Egyptians rule, and we can feel and sense how it is easier for them to rule over the main, hi the main uh, thoroughways, the main hi highways, the main centers, the ports, and so on, but more difficult with the highlands. The highlanders are the troublemakers uh, in the Amarna correspondence, and this is important to remember. Right, so can you give me an example of some of the activities of these city-state rulers? Like, what are these highlanders doing? First of all, they all complain about each other. So they complain about what? About danger to the Egyptians from certain uh, forces in Canaan. And the fact that certain kings, petty kings, have plans to go against the Egyptian administration. Uh, but really, I mean, the complaints are a little bit empty because we know from the letters themselves that when they really ask for help, they ask for 50 soldiers, 100 soldiers to come and pacify a situation. So it's not uh, really dif too difficult for the Egyptians. Uh, however, there are uh, issues uh, here, and uh, we can see that they basically accuse each other of cooperating with uh, a group named with people named Apiru. Now, the Apiru, this is a very well-known uh, title. Uh, in the beginning of research, uh, there were scholars who made the equation between Apiru and Hebrews. However, there is no such ethnic, if you wish, equation. The, the description of Apiru, Apiru, they are what? They are the outcasts. They are the troublemakers outside of the main uh, administrative situation in Canaan. And they are accused of cooperating uh, with, the, with the certain uh, city-states against the pharaohs. So uh, they uh, are living outside of the main towns, let's put it this way. Uh, but they are not nomadic, as some people used to say. They are there as groups of maybe uh, bandits, uh, gangs, uh, certain sort of mercenaries, uh, uh, for the petty kings of Canaan. And then there is another group which is important called Shosu. And uh, these are the Bedouin, the semi-nomadic groups apparently. And when we speak about the rise of ancient Israel, we have to pinpoint, we have to take a very close look at these two groups which live outside of the main centers of power in Canaan of the time. Right, so the Amarna letters give us a good understanding of the city-state situation, of Egyptian rule over it, they hint at these other populations that don't seem to be under anyone else's control. The Apiru, it's almost like a term that the, the organized city dwellers are using for outsiders that are not under someone's control. Yeah. Probably it's not a unified group. Sure, the, nobody goes in Canaan of the 14th century with a sticker on the forehead, I'm an Apiru. Right. Apiru is a situation that there are groups that are being accused by X or Y for cooperating uh, against, uh, for, uh, uh, against the Egyptian interest in Canaan. Uh, and they are interesting because they show some sort of unrest of certain groups in the period before the rise of ancient Israel. So they are the, uh, we cannot say that these are the Israelites, of course. I, we can say that ancient Israel included probably uh, in it, you know, certain groups that came from, if you wish, Apiru background, but at the, at the same time also from other backgrounds in Canaan of the Late Bronze Age. So what we're trying to do here is, is in a way set the stage for ancient Israel. And in a lot of ways, the city-state interactions during the Late Bronze Age kind of form a model of how people in this region interact with one another. Does any of 
that model, is any of that applicable to the rise of ancient Israel? Absolutely. I'll tell you why. Because I am a great believer, and I think you too, in the long durée, in the long term, in understanding historical processes by looking at uh, the long-term perspectives of settlement patterns, material culture, bigger, broader social historical processes, and so on. And from this point of view, the Amarna letters are really essential for understanding the rise of ancient Israel in, the, in what? Let me give you two examples, I think, uh, or maybe three. The first example is the fact that in the Bronze Age, in the second millennium, we are dealing with two centers in the highlands, one in Jerusalem and another one in Shechem. When you look very carefully at the situation in biblical times, in the time of the two Hebrew kingdoms, what are the two Hebrew kingdoms? They are exactly the city-states of Jerusalem and Shechem, which means Jerusalem, Judah, and Shechem was maybe in the very beginning the capital of the northern kingdom uh, when it really was in its very early days. More than that, I think that we can um, see more. In fact, when you look critically at archaeology and the biblical material and the extra-biblical text, I think that you can come to the conclusion that in the beginning of the two Hebrew kingdoms, Judah, for instance, was basically a city-state. It was not very different from Jerusalem of Abichipa of the 14th century BC. There came a moment when Judah grew in order to become a territorial kingdom. And the same goes for Israel. So, uh, in fact, what I'm saying is that we have to really look very carefully into the uh, uh, transformation of the highlands from two city-states into two territorial kingdoms. The meaning is when the city-states of the highlands expand to take over territories in the lowlands. Only then they become really territorial kingdoms. But the beginning is in the two Amarna uh, centers of Jerusalem and Shechem. And another example, I think, is uh, to look very carefully at Shechem. Shechem is a very specific and peculiar situation in the Amarna tablets. There is this ruler there, Labayo, and he is scheming, you know, uh, in order to expand. He wants to take uh, um, maybe advantage of a situation of maybe a little bit of weakening of Egyptian control in order to expand. And when uh, you can follow really his expansion plans according to the letters, his own, and uh, even more so those who are complaining against him. And uh, looking very carefully at this, one can see that the expansion of uh, Labayo, the ruler of Shechem, in the Amarna period is not very different from the expansion of the Northerners in order to establish the Northern Kingdom, also for she from Shechem, into the Jezreel Valley and beyond, let's say, in the late uh, 10th century BC. And there, of course, there are also uh, specific situations which are interesting in the Amarna period. One very famous example is the case of uh, the town, the the, the, the dispute over the affiliation of the town of Keila, which reminds one, one uh, very much of the story uh, in the Bible, in the book of Samuel, of uh, King David coming to the rescue of Keila. So we can really come also to specific cases in the Amarna tablets. Wow. We will soon be discussing the utter destruction of late Bronze Age society all over the Mediterranean and Near East. And I think for the long history of scholarship in this region, that has served as a break between late Bronze Age life and Iron Age biblical life. And so there's a real innovation to, to argue that the motives and interests of people of the late Bronze Age city-states might be the same as the Israelite city-states and territorial. Yeah, sure. You are now touching, um, you know, on very critical questions of the origin of the ancient Israelites, who they were exactly, and also on, on something that we will discuss later in the series of the situation in Canaan in the Iron One, which was uh, basically continuation of the late Bronze Age. So we are in a shift of paradigm. You're right about this. A shift of paradigm between uh, from seeing the watershed uh, in Canaan, let's say, with the breakdown of the city-states under Egyptian domination in the 12th century BC, 
to a, a situation a little bit later of the final breakdown of Canaanite culture and territorial disposition uh, a while later already within the Iron Age, into the Iron Age. So how much can we really say at this point does the Bible or the biblical authors know or remember the Late Bronze Age? So this is also crucial because we really described here a situation of what? City-states and Egyptian rule. The Bible does not know about this. There is no clue in the Bible about Egypt uh, actually ruling over Canaan. There is no memory in the Bible of the 14th century BC. And since we know that Egyptian rule in Canaan continued in the, into the 13th century and even became even more powerful maybe under Rameses II, for instance, and then into the 12th century until the 1130s or so, and still the Bible does not know about them. So there is no recollection in the Bible about the 12th century, and we will have to take this into consideration later in our talks. Great. Thanks for discussing the Late Bronze Age background. I think in our next talk, we'll, uh, we'll look at this collapse of the Late Bronze Age in more detail. Absolutely.